The generation that lived through World War I is gone, and the last surviving veterans have died. But their memories live on in a remarkable project that recorded their stories on film. Young people like myself are saying, we'll show those Germans, we'll push them back home. Remember when you went and great big posters up of kitchen of his, this finger seemed to be pointing at your king and country need you. In this series, those who were there tell the story of the war in their own words. You've got no feeling to have humanity. Right then. Afterwards, yes. In this episode, we hear how the outbreak of war turned lives upside down. My heart stood still. I have suddenly realized that this was a warfare. I may not return. Whether you're going to shoot Germans or whether they're going to shoot you, you never know what, <laughs> what the future held. These last veterans of World War I revealed their experiences in the hope that what they went through would never be forgotten. In 1914, German troops invaded Belgium, their sights set on Paris. A shocked Britain gave the Kaiser an ultimatum to withdraw or face the consequences. But German troops ignored the ultimatum, so Britain declared war. As the British army set sail, the public was sure of swift success. Richard Hawkins was just 19 and full of confidence. This country ruled the British Empire, and the British Empire ruled the world. And it was a very, very different place. I mean, we, 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 we were the best country in the world, the best everything in the world. We were all very proud of ourselves. And as a young man, it was my young, my duty and the duty of every young man to go and defend it against all invaders and to give, if necessary, our lives to do it. Thousands of young Britons were eager to volunteer. When the call came to serve your country, the chance of honour and adventure stirred a young Robbie Burns. Remember you went in Glasgow, the great big posters up of kitchen of his finger pointing at you. No matter where you were, this finger seemed to be pointing at you. Your king and country need you. I could hear the paper and the left, right, left, right. I could see probably two or three hundred men, some with bowler hats and some with what we call skips that is, flat caps. And uh, the pipes always did, seemed to do something to rouse my enthusiasm. I thought to myself, well, I want to do something like this. I never thought of being killed. Never thought of that. And I thought it'd be good fun killing somebody. Twenty-year-old Londoner Jack Rogers felt the conflict was personal. Blinking old Kaiser and his son, we used to hate them people, but uh, we certainly wanted to, you know, get out and do our bit because we thought they might be taken over here, you see, and we didn't want that to happen. So we'd do anything that's to fight, of course, and keep them from coming here. Cues to sign up formed over a mile long. Kitchener had no trouble in finding the first 100,000. Damn it, you couldn't get in, into the Ruddy Army. There was such a, a rush to get there, to get on, and defeat the, the, the enemy and prevent him from taking over this country. 
Among the first to enlist was an enthusiastic Dick Barron, then 18. I think I got my idea with a lot of young fellows uh, from Boy's Own Paper and, and the soldiers were very, very uh, spectacular creatures. And how they fought in the Crimea and uh, won the wonderful charge of the Light Brigade. It was all very romantic. We didn't think of the worst part of warfare. In Liverpool, Florence Billington found herself comforting her sweetheart Ted as he prepared to leave for France. He was worried to death and I was trying to comfort him. I didn't know what to say. I knew nothing about war or anything like that. But all I could do was to tell him to look on the bright side, that there were better days in store when it was all over. But he was quite convinced that he, he, was, he was going to be killed. Eagerness to join up affected young and old. Len Whitehead's family soon caught the popular mood. Everybody terribly excited. Nobody more excited than my elder brother, George. He was so keen to go. He went into my mother's bedroom. She, had, she was not very well at the time and was in bed. And he picked up a stick, tucked it under his arm and marched about the bedroom. This is how I should strut about the London parks, he said. <laughs> Jokingly, of course. I don't think it, it occurred to any of them that they might never come back again. It was a sort of glamour of it all. But uh, he did go. Yes, he went. Friends, neighbours, workmates, together joined what became known as Pals Battalions. George Littlefair went in with his best friend, Joe. I had a pal in the army, and we were the best of pals together, and they called him Joe. We had our ups and downs between us, but still we were always good pals with one another, helped one another. Uh. Ted Francis volunteered for the 16th Warwickshires, the Birmingham Pals. You'd have thought that an extra bank holiday had been told in Birmingham because people were excited, laughing, joking. Uh, young people like myself were saying, we'll show those Germans, we'll push them back home. How dare they walk over little Belgium, etc., etc. And we were anxious to get to France, to, to have a go at them, to push them back into Germany. Taking charge of these novice soldiers and forming them into army units was the responsibility of new officers. After first enlisting into the infantry, 19-year-old officer cadet Richard Hawkins was commissioned and given his first platoon. And why the hell they did as they were told by a young man, uh, probably younger than they were, I don't quite know, except that they were told that I was in charge of them and I was the officer and they'd got to do as they were, and they did. No question of it. The morale was tremendous. We were anxious to get on with the job. We wanted to go to France and stop this nonsense. And uh, we were all, I think, very proud to be in the army, defending our country for the people to come after us. Men were desperate to see action, but first came drills to form them into a fighting machine. As they set off, they remained enthusiastic. 
with little idea of the horrors that awaited them. Dick Barron felt the excitement of leaving. The whole of the ship's company, from the top deck right down, including ourselves, suddenly burst into song in unison. Homeland, homeland, when shall I see you again? Land of my birth, dearest place on earth, I'm leaving you. Oh, it may be for years, and it may be forever. Homeland, homeland. Up to then, the whole thing had been most enjoyable, but I, my heart stood still. I suddenly realized that this was a warfare. I may not return. As the men arrived in France, they were in fighting mood. Units went towards the lines with little idea of what to expect. No, there's no unhappiness about it because at that time, at that time we hadn't uh, been in the front line trenches or reserve trenches. We didn't know what the war really was. You could probably hear a very, very faint noise of gunfire, very, very faint. And then the nearer we got, of course, to that, then we realised what we're in against. Ah, then we began to shake then. <laughs> yeah, we began to shake then, the nearer, the nearer we got to the front line. It was pouring with rain. We're just on foot walking up to marching, as it were, laden right up with all our equipment, all you could carry, you know, everything on, and bed up with your guns, you've got everything on. And suddenly you begin to see the sky lighting up, flashing, 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 and you begin to hear the noise of the guns. You know, you're getting nearer, you're getting nearer. You can't help feeling butterflies in your tummy whether you're going to shoot Germans or whether you're going to shoot you. You never know what, <laughs> what the future held. That was a terrible thought, really. Going into war is not a very pleasant experience. Terrible. As casualties mounted, realism dawned. The great sensation was the first man in the company to be killed. It, it kind of sobered us up. And in another day or two, two or three were killed or wounded. And uh, it all came to our minds. This was no outing. This was real. And uh, a German sniper really, uh, only wants a few seconds of your head and you'll get a bullet. Shells proved more deadly than bullets. Shrapnel from artillery fire wounded or killed more soldiers than any other weapons. Even the indirect effects of shell bursts were devastating, as Jack Rogers discovered. One of the great big shells landed right on the earth above us and exploded. And all of a sudden, of course, all the earth above us all suddenly collapsed and came right down straight on top of us, absolutely as we were sitting there, buried us just completely alive. It covers right in. And I knew I must have been struggling hard to breathe. I couldn't move. I couldn't move hand, foot, only my toes in my boots. More terrifying than artillery barrages was the prospect of abandoning the shelter of the trenches to advance into no man's land. 
Ted Francis went forward with his brother Harry. When you're waiting at a certain time to go over the top, you hear, hear the officer blow a loud whistle. Well, that's the time that you're supposed to scramble and get over the top and dash for the nearest shallow. But Harry and I, on the sound of the whistle, we didn't jump up and get over. Those that did were mercilessly cut down by machine guns and killed and wounded. But we waited till the machine gun had uh, passed our trench and then dashed over quick. And that, in a, in a good many instances, no doubt, saved us from being killed or wounded. You didn't do anything bloody daft. You know, I'm, I'm a British, I'm in that style, you didn't do that. You went over very quietly. Well, there's a big shelter, you took it. Uh, Sergeant will shout, get down, get down. Aye. You go down. You'd uh, get in the back of a bloody thistle if you for shelter. If you... And the guns would fire almost straight at you. Bang, 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 bang. More than once you could hear the whiz of a shell going past. See, up here on my right, I was speaking to him about something. And then I turned to this fellow, I turned back again, he was missing. One of those shells, straight at him. Then I turned to this fellow on my left, I said, Bill's gone. And I turned to this fellow, lying there, down. Before he left for the front, Florence Billington's sweetheart, Ted, had promised as soon as the war ended, they'd get engaged. Now their love letters took on a different meaning. I was working at the uh, Palace Hotel, Buxton, and one of the porters came up with this uh, letter from the um, war office, official looking. When I saw it, uh, my heart sank a little bit. I thought it must be something very, very important. And when I opened it, it was to say that they regretted to tell me that uh, Edward had been killed. The, uh, the letters from me were found on his body, and that's why, that's why they could uh, find out where I was. I couldn't really, I couldn't really imagine him not being there. I couldn't imagine it. I thought, I thought maybe one day they'll find out they made a mistake and perhaps he might turn up one day. When George Littlefair's battalion went over the top, his best friend Joe was killed. I knew what had happened, and down he went and groaned, and that was it. I did get on, because another wave was coming off behind us. If I'd had time to do it, to lift his head up and try to talk to him, that's what I would have tried to do, but no good. He had to keep going. Either that or he'll get trampled on. We've not even said so long to one another. Hey. If they survived the dash across no man's land, the attackers closed on the enemy front line and faced a terrifying prospect of trench fighting with brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Even at close quarters, most men resorted to the bullet, not the bayonet. Aye, no, just pull the trigger and down he would go. Aye. <laughs> I 
It made you never forget it. Never. Now even to this day. To, to think you, you shot a man, you know, for, and do nothing at you. That was the way. I used to always look at it. And then again, he would say, well, if I don't get him, he'll get me, and my life is worth a hell of a lot to me. <laughs> That's how we were on, young and daft. Hey. For the first year of the war, attack and counter-attack gained little. Bullets and shell fire took their toll. Sir Richard Hawkins deployed the army's secret weapon. I went round with the rum bottle every morning at dawn, round the trenches. And I said, I'm going to be exaggerated, but you could feel that rum going down into your boots, which were probably full of icy water, drying up the water, coming up to you and saying, look at that, and now where's that ruddy hun? It saved lives. It was old Navy rum. But that old Navy stuff, one would have taken on of the whole of Germany at dawn in the morning. And I don't exaggerate about that. But it would take more than patriotism laced with Dutch courage to win the war. In the next episode, we hear from those who lived through the British Army's bloodiest day, the Battle of the Somme. series in remembrance of the lost heroes of World War I continues tomorrow night at 7.30. Next tonight on Channel 5, we check out the tech that can do stuff just as well as we can in the continuing new series of The Gadget Show.